Good afternoon, everybody, or good Sunday, and I'm going to get real with you today about the deepest addiction I've ever faced. First, a couple of logistics. Say hello in the comments. Drop a thumbs up below <laughs> if you want access to a free class I did on the Relating Revolution. We have a new cohort coming up in February, so private message me if you're interested. Questions, comments below, please, uh, the more you engage, the more I ha am inspired. So feel free to either send me a private message or comment below. So the deepest addiction that I've ever faced. It's not quite what you think because I have been through some of your typical addictions, um, you know, Certainly by any, anyone's standards, alcohol was a problem. By anyone's standards, marijuana was a problem. Uh, overeating, problem, definitely. Compulsive sleeping, problem, definitely. So I've had some very, I've had some very challenging moments with some things that are definitely more typical uh, compulsions, but what I've realized is that there is something underneath them all. And underneath them all, and, and you, this might be a, a foreign concept to you, but I'll explain it. Underneath them all is actually an addiction to who I was. Let me explain. An addiction to the past. Let me explain some more. An addiction to the emotional state of being that I am accustomed to. Every single time we think a thought, we produce chemicals. These chemicals, we call them emotions, but these chemicals course through our veins. They course through our body. They affect our organs. There's no such thing as a disembodied state of being. And so people say, you know, we have food compulsions or whatever. People say, we are what we eat, and that is true. Actually, even more true than you might think about sometimes. Because what we are eating on a cellular level, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, is our state of being. What That has a far bigger impact, a far greater impact than the few times a day that we eat food or drink. Now, of course, we could ramp it up and be really eating very, very toxic things and very poisonous things, but most of us actually eat pretty well. And we wonder why we don't feel good. We wonder why we feel crappy. We wonder why we feel tired. We wonder why we feel anxious, angry, confused, even though we exercise, even though we, even though we uh, eat pretty well, even though we're relatively pretty healthy, we're like, why the hell am I not getting results? Why do I still not feel so great? Because our state of being has the number one influence in our life is our state of our state of mind, our state of thinking, our state of emotion, and the way that these two interrelate with each other create our state of being. And this is embodied. This is not ethereal. This is not intellectual. Anger is tension in the jaw, tension in the shoulders, a feeling girded up. It is, uh, impacts my liver, impacts my heart. It impacts my whole muscle, muscle tone. It impacts my blood pressure, my hormone levels, my neurotransmitters, my chemistry. It is an embodied thing. And when we are in a state of being consistently, frequently, with frequency, intensity, and duration. Hey, Cousin Jim, how are you, man? When we are in a state of being for a, a, a long period of time, we actually become addicted to the chemicals, to the neurology, to the biology, to the chemistry of that state of being because our body is really, really expert at generating what is a, a homeostasis. Homeostasis is a for better or worse natural principle. Our body is really good at saying, okay, this is what we got to work with. I'm going to make this normal. I'm going to set my thermostat to, you know, 66 degrees 
Fahrenheit because that's what feels comfy, comfortable and cozy. And if it's been, if it, it's anxiety, if it's been, if we've been anxious for the better part of the last, you know, 10, 15 years or even the last couple months, then our body will adjust to that and say, okay, this is what we got. This is what we want. And this is what we're used to. This is all, all I'm going to ramp this up. I'm going to ramp this down just so that this can feel kind of normal, right? And then when we go to try to do something different, when we go to try to change, it actually trips our alarm system. It trips the thermostat to say, uh-oh, uh-oh, what are you doing? 67, 68 degrees, 64 degrees, uh, that doesn't feel right to me. Let me activate things in my chemistry to get me back to 66. Okay, oh, phew, phew, phew. Now that's good. So the, the thing is, is that we are in a state of being 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we are eating this neurobiochemical stew all the time. Again, we eat a few times a day. We drink a little bit more than that. But, and those things do have an impact on our health. We exercise hopefully once a day. That has a huge impact on our health. That alters our chemistry also. But it is our state of being that is 24-7. Oftentimes we'll sleep and wake up exhausted. Well, why is that? Because our state of being in our sleep is one of anxiety, is one of tension, is one of stress. Oftentimes we will you know, do all, be doing all the right things to feel better, to feel healthy, to feel happy, but we are not getting at this deepest addiction. And why I use the term addiction, it, I don't use that lightly. I've worked, I was, the, I was the director of an intensive outpatient addiction program for many years. I've worked with people on crystal meth and cocaine and, you know, all sorts of these intense, intense physiological addictions from illicit drugs. So I'm not saying this lightly. I'm saying that underneath it all is an addiction to the emotions of who we were. Hey, Michael, how are you? Nice to see you. Welcome. Underneath it all is an addiction to the emotions of who we were. And, when, and, and it is so important to know that when we go to change, we will feel a sort of withdrawal. Something will not feel right. It will feel weird. It will feel uncomfortable. And so the biggest thing that I've learned to, in order to break this addiction to my past and break this addiction to who I was is that it takes courage. It takes consistency. When we're talking about in, in, in recovery programs, we're talking about it takes about, you know, 15 days for the brain to get through withdrawal, depending on what the substance has been used. It takes about after that, there's a honeymoon period where we feel pretty good and our body's like actually kind of overproducing positive chemicals to help us get through this process. And then we hit a wall at around stage 45 where we're like, oh man, we feel kind of crappy again. And then around day 120, we start to feel kind of like, okay, this is a consistently a new normal. So when we're going to change, it actually requires a tremendous degree of consistency and until we get a new normal, until our body adjusts to a new way of being that we value and choose, so say it's peace and calmness and love and joy, of course that's preferable to this part of the brain, to what we think. But to this part of the brain that is accustomed to anxiety or, or depression or anger or, or you know feeling like a piece of shit or feeling less than or unworthy or you know, self, self loathing or self hatred. If this deeper part of our chemistry is, is kind of, if that's our normal, if that's our 66 and we go to try to be, you know, we go to try and you know, this is relevant right now. How many people are working on new year's resolutions right now? Well, guess what? It needs to be followed through for months before you're going to be at a new normal. And along the way, you are gonna feel very uncomfortable actually, even with positive changes. And what typically happens is that people will come up against these walls and they will come up against these shells and they'll have a big, we, my, not, not just they, me, uh, this have been through this so many times, we'll have a big emotional reaction. So what happens is, is we're like, okay, I'm going, I'm going, I'm doing this, I'm now I'm meditating, now I'm exercising, now I'm eating well and I'm feeling good. And then the body is like, wait, holy shit, I'm used to feeling 66, I'm used to being 66 degrees, I'm used to anxiety, I'm used to the neurology, biology, chemistry of anxiety. 
You're now trying to feel happy? I don't understand what that is. And so what happens is, is that discomfort, what happens is that trips the alarm system in our brain deep in the subconscious, beneath our conscious awareness. And when the alarm goes off, that is underneath our intellectual knowing, that is before our intellectual knowing, then what happens is it sends an impulse up into the higher parts of the brain. And the higher parts of the brain that want to know, that want to understand, aren't able to identify the reason why something feels wrong. Something doesn't feel quite right. We feel uncomfortable, we feel nervous, we feel just not right. And so then what the thinking part of the brain does is then it will scan the outer environment and the inner environment to find a story that seems to be the reason why we feel something is wrong. And what we will do is we will misidentify the culprit and we will go trying to fix the story of why we think we are upset. So for example, it's like, I just feel uncomfortable and I don't know why, and that's deep, deep down here. But then I go, oh, well, it must be because I haven't paid that bill, or it must be because my wife's a pain in the ass, or it must be because I'm not in the right job, or it must be because, and we will then, and then what we will do is go fixing those things. And what has happened is we've bought into the addiction from the past, and now we're doing the same things that we have done in the past. We are reacting the same patterns over and over again. And the chemistry down here goes, ah, I got my fix. I'm anxious again. I'm worried again. I'm angry again. I'm judging again. That feels good. 66 degrees, baby. Right? So this is a really tricky predicament. And that's why I'm calling it an addiction because it actually takes a tremendous amount of skill, dedication, commitment, courage, to move all the way through this and create a new normal. The analogy that I like about this is that that can also help you to understand it more deeply is it's like, it's like when there's a, when the, say imagine that our smoke alarm is going off, right? The smoke alarm is going beep, 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 beep. And so you wake up in the middle of the night, it's two in the morning, you're like the smoke alarm's going off and you go right into a state of fight, flight, or freeze. You're like, okay, boom, I'm taking action. And then your brain thinks, well, hey, Marcus, nice to see you, man. Then the brain thinks, oh, the smoke, because the smoke alarm is going off, there must be a fire. We, we, say, we assume there must be a fire. So instead of checking if there is a fire, we start spraying everything with a fire extinguisher. Whoosh, oh, spray it all, spray it all, the couch, get the oven. You know, we start spraying all the hot spots. Get out of the house, kids, get out of the house, get out in the freezing cold, you know, emergency, emergency, emergency. We start acting like there's a real fire because the smoke alarm is going off. But then we go, uh-oh, we go, uh-oh, I, I don't see, I don't, I actually, we wake up, we wake up from our state of frenzy and we go, uh-oh, there's no, I don't smell any smoke, I don't see anything charred, huh, I wonder what it, then we go and the smoke alarm's still going off, what the heck? And then we go and we just look and we see, oh, faulty wiring, battery's dead. That was all, that was it. But now here's the tricky part with this pattern is now we have created real problems in our life by fixing the thing, the fire that wasn't there. Now we've ruined our couch, we've ruined our oven, we need to go and buy all this new stuff and repair the damage from fixing the story of why we thought we were upset. So this is a tricky little addiction when really underneath it all is like we just need to learn how to work on the smoke detector. And so this is what I've learned through confronting the addictions that are underneath the addictions.